see how this goes. Uh, I'm definitely going to need your guys' help on this. Um, it's like I've reached a certain level of mastery with Odor. I've been doing it 100% for more than five years. Uh, so there's probably a lot of things which are super obvious to me, um, which you guys might still find unclear, confusing, or just not familiar with it. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of stuff today with macros and exploring the subtleties of namespaces and eval and symbols. Um, so if you guys find anything unclear or confusing, just raise your hand and interrupt me and talk about it. I want this to be as interactive as possible because this is going to be pretty challenging material and I want you guys to get the most of it. Um, okay, so let me just do a quick poll to just understand where we all stand here. Uh, so raise your hand if you're, you feel like you're an expert in code or like you know macros inside and out and all that stuff. Okay. Raise your hand if you're like a you no know closure pretty well, but you don't feel like you've mastered the esoteric aspects of it. Okay, raise your hand if you're just totally new to closure and you just toy around with it. Okay, not as bad as I, as I thought. Um, uh, second poll uh, with regards to Spectre. Uh, raise your hand if you use Spectre and you know it pretty well. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with Spectre, you've watched my talk, like the talk I've given on it. Okay, and raise your hand if you're just holding it. Like, like, like. All right, okay. All right, so let's get started. So I'll just start off with just some basic examples of Spectre so we know what we're talking about. This talk is not about Spectre. Um, it's about inline caching, but it's about Spectre's image. It's going to demonstrate this idea of inline caching at the library level uh, by showing Spectre's implementation. You'll, you will need to know at least a little bit about what Spectre is and how it works. Um, so maybe just open up this graph a little bit. Uh, and the way we do that is we navigate 
to this name, filter I, which navigates to a filtered view of the sequence. So it literally just navigates to a sequence of all the odd numbers from the original sequence. Um, and then we're going to navigate to the last element of that sequence. And you can see when I run this, the last odd number got incremented and everything else stayed the same. Uh, so these navigators are figuring out um, how do you reconstruct that what we chained back into the original sequence that we cared about? Uh, just two more examples, uh, or three more examples, um, and then we'll get to the inline caching stuff. Uh, this one here will take all the even numbers between indexes 4 and 11 and reverse their positions. That's what it shows. It does. So you can see that, um, you can see like a bunch of even numbers in the middle of the sequence got the positions reversed. So like 10, 8, 6, 4. Uh, the, way, the way we express this is we navigate to uh, the subsequence from indices 4 to 11. Um, and then we navigate to a filter view of that sequence of just even numbers. Uh, so the transformation function will receive a sequence of even numbers. We revert, reverse them. And then again, these navigators figure out how to reconstruct that back uh, into the original sequence. Uh, think of it as navigation. Like it just says how to get from where you currently are to this to the next sub value. So S range navigates you from a sequence to a subsequence. And encoded inside the implementation navigator is also how to go back when that subsequence changes. Does that make sense? It's not and it's, it's not predicates, it's navigation, how to get from step from place to place. It's a little very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so like just like um, like with this one over here, where they all all. So from a sequence, we navigate to every element of the sequence. When we do all again, it means those sub values are also sequences, and they navigate to every element of those. Just think of it in terms of like the like following path. Um, so this next example, um, uh, we're going to take this again a sequence of sequence of numbers, and what we want to do is for every se uh, sequence that has at least two even numbers, we're going to append the values uh, keyword C and keyword D to it. Uh, so here what we do is we navigate to every subsequence, um, and then for each of those, we will stay navigated there if this subpath selects something. Um, and so this will stay navigated if that sequence has at least two even numbers. And so the query path is navigate to the sequence of even numbers, um, U navigates to just the result for running the function on it. So this uh, will navigate to the number of even numbers in that sequence, and then we um, have this predicate to determine um, if we should select it or not. Uh, if we get past there, then that sequence has at least two even numbers. Then we navigate to N, which is the empty subsequence at the very end of the sequence. Um, we set that to the values of 1 and 10. And you see if I run that, um, the first and third sequences have keyword C, keyword D uh, appended to it. Um, I know this is kind of a lot for you to take in if you've never seen Spectre before, but uh, I'm just trying to give you guys a general sense of it. Uh, again, this is not an introductory talk about Spectre. Um, so, uh, uh, ask, it is really confusing this. Please ask a question. Uh, so the last example I want to show is um, I'm going to take this uh, tree, which is just like arbitrarily nested vectors, and we're going to do, we're going to reverse the order of the even numbers according to a depth first search. Uh, so when we do that is we transform and we navigate to the thing called subselect. We're going to do a normal select. Let me show you what it does. Um, you can see when I run that, the, um, when the even numbers got reversed. And it doesn't matter how they're nested inside this tree. Um, and what we do is we navigate to the selection of walking for numbers um, and then filtering for even, those that are even. And then the transformation function will receive a sequence of even numbers as everything is found um, in the tree. We reverse them and then the subselect thing knows how to um, translate that back into the original data. Okay, you guys following general? Okay, all right. So that's Spectre has um, has have multiple navigators in them, which is a sequence of steps. And um, the point of this presentation is that Spectre does all of this incredibly fast. 
Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to believe how fast it is. Um, I had a lot of exciting moments when I got stuff working, um, and it's surprising. And that, so, so what we'll do now is actually just show how fast this thing is. So what happened here is there's a few benchmarks. Um, and what we're going to do is run um, each of these lines um, the same number of iterations, and it'll show comparison for how long each one takes. So let me run this one. Uh, so this is, this is uh, uh, benchmarking query engine. Okay, so you can see that if you just, this is, uh, uh, this is benchmarking uh, getting a value out of a nested map. So go to the A key and the D key and the C key. Uh, and this is the data that we are working with. It's a triple nested map. So you can see if you just take the data and just inline, you know, get the value for A, get the value for B, get the value for C, that takes about 53 milliseconds here. If you use get in, which is one of Clojure's very few um, uh, pieces of functionality for doing these kinds of nested operations, that takes about 160 milliseconds. And when you use Spectre select any operation, it's uh, faster than get it's significantly faster than get in. Um, so it's fast. Um, and you can see that it's, what the example I've shown is a very high level abstraction, it's very powerful, but we're not sacrificing any performance. And that's what we're getting performance gain. Uh, the next benchmark I want to show. Why is it getting slower than the threading? Yeah. Well, uh, the threading is inline. It's just call A, call B, call C. Get in has to do with reduce over the past sequence that you passed in. So you have extra overhead for just doing the sequence and that stuff. Um, all right, so here's the, the benchmark for updating the nested map. Um, so I have this uh, manual transform function, which just does it basically inline. Update M, A keyword. Nested function, update the nested map, B keyword. Nested function, update the nested map, C with the function. Right? So the manual transform is the fastest, and Spectre is 9% slower. Um, and you can see update M is like crazy slow. Um, now, the new version of the folder, uh, 1.9, I don't think it's come out yet, uh, they did optimization, so they made update in five times faster, and it's still a lot slower than the Spectre. Um, the point here is the Spectre is really fast, and today we're going to see how it's so fast. Okay, one more uh, benchmark. So here's going to be a benchmark which does um, something besides keyword navigation. Um, so I have defined these functions. Um, I have two separate implementations for this idea of map vowels. We're going to take a map and run a function on all the values in the map, and then get a map back. Um, so the first uh, implementation is kind of, this is what I used to do before I had Spectre. Um, and I actually had a function called map vowels, which pretty much had this exact implementation, where the way you do map vowels is you do a four of the map, take the key value pairs, return new pack pair of the key, and the function run over, run over the value, and then you um, pipe all that into a new map, to construct a new map. Um, the second implementation does this, uh, some, basically the same thing, except using the reduce AB uh, function, which is uh, much more optimized for doing a map iteration. Um, and so we're gonna compare it using these against using Spectre. Um, and the actual transformation we do is we're looking at a map of vectors of mass, and we want to increment all the numbers all the way nested in all those maps. Um, so you can see with just closure manually, you take your either map balance function, and then you have a nested function, and you map the all map balance again. Um, and with Spectre, it's transform map balance all map balance. That's your path. Um, okay, so let's uh, run the benchmark and see. Yeah. That's uh, that's good for large maps. It actually will be slower for small maps. Yeah. Okay. So um, this should be pretty interesting. Uh, so that first map valve you can see is just ridiculously slower than everything else. Um, it shouldn't be surprising if you know anything about how like four works, translate the sequence with tons of overhead to that iteration. Um, has to take the key value pairs and like wrap them in um, map entries and stuff like that. 
Um, MapBalance 2, which is reduced to the is a lot faster than MapBalance. Um, as you expect, using an optimized interface for maps. Uh, Inspector is even faster. Um, and if you're wondering like how, uh, and by the way, this isn't a fluke of the benchmark, like it is actually faster than MapBalance 2. Um, so part of that is just due to this thing like caching stuff, where there's almost no overhead to just the actual compositional aspect of combining navigators. And part of it is just due to the fact that Spectre, um, I've done a lot of like work understanding like Photos internals. And so it turns out that the best way to do map analysis on a, um, on a small map is actually to, um, if you guys know how persistent array map works, it's literally just an array. Um, and then it like wraps a map interface over it. And so the best way to do map battles over it is to construct a new array manually. Um, and then manually construct a persistent array map and pass it in a new array. That's what Spectre does, and it's, um, you know, it's faster than it was uh, So that stuff is all encapsulated, abstracted away from you. You separate this title of abstraction, uh, you know, about that stuff. Alright, so let's get into the um, so let's get into how this works. How is it possible for Spectre to be so fast? Um, so what I'm going to start off with is uh, so Spectre's um, core protocol, the same called Navigator, um, and every one of those elements in the paths that we're showing uh, implements this interface. Um, and um, so there's two code paths, one for the select path where you're just um, doing queries, one for the transform path where you're just trying to manipulate an estimate value and then reconstruct the transformation of that estimate value back into the real structure. Uh, I think this will make more sense if I actually just look at a specific implementation. Okay, so like here's the implementation of the key path. Uh, this is what um, keywords use, and you can also use keypath uh, directly if you want to navigate by a non-keyword key. And so you see keypath is parameterized by the key to navigate by. Um, and to do queries, um, what the query path needs to do is call the next one on any sub-values from this point. And the only sub-value from this point is going to be the, the value of that key in this data structure. Um, for the transform case, the next one that's passed in will do the transformation of any sub-values from here. And this needs to um, transform the sub-value and integrate it back into the original structure. Uh, so in this case, it's really simple. We just call update structure with the key. And next one is the update function. Okay. Now, in terms of what Spectre actually does, um, the only way to make this, only way to make Spectre um, as fast as it is, is to um, you can't just take this sequence, um, this path sequence, and like interpret it and like reduce over the sequence um, every single time you run. Uh, what it actually does is it takes the path and it compiles it into a deeply nested function, um, and then it can just run that function on every indication. And we're really fast because it's already composed because we use it every single, every single time. And so for like the navigation of navigating to um, like keyword A, keyword B, keyword C, the nested function produces will be something like this. Uh, I've simplified it from the reality as um, you, know, you oftentimes have to do a presentation like this, but this captures like, like the core of what Spectre is doing. Um, so basically, um, for this path, we're going to take have three navigators, one for A, one for B, one for C. Um, and we're going to have a function like this, where, um, uh, so we're going to take three navigators and combine them into one navigator, still implementing the same interface. Uh, and then here I'm just showing for the transform case. It's pretty much the same thing for the select case. Um, so the, top, the, the new navigator, calls transform on nav1 on the structure, and then the next function, well, the, the transformation function for the sub-value, should call transform on nav2 with the sub-value, and then that next function should call transform on nav3 
on S3 and then give it the original next line from here. Does that make sense to everyone? Composition. Okay. So it's basically, that's the core of what Spectre is doing, is taking something like this and producing something like this and then reusing it. Um, Using, uh, code. Yeah, so, uh, sorry, I'm just parsing this in my eyes. In, in what you're actually doing, do you, I noticed that the closure is inside of the function. Is that how it, but that's, that's going to be an allocation when it runs. Is the closure above that, or at uh, runtime, do you take that allocation when you actually do it? The allocation for the inner uh, functions. Yeah, you pay that allocation. Yeah. Uh, not really anywhere around that. It's just the, that's, that is the cost of the abstraction. Um, it's a pretty minimal cost, I can see from the Oh, there it is, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. All right. Um, okay, now, um, when Spectre compiles that path, um, there's actually a lot more it has to do, um, besides just composing these functions together you know, like that. Um, so for starters, um, so this is a protocol, right? So when you invoke these protocol methods, you're going to pay the overhead, the overhead of the fact that it is a protocol. Um, now protocols are really fast, um, but they are not as fast as function navigation. Um, and uh, especially when you do like a really fast navigation, like navigating that keyword, you see the overhead of protocols. Um, I think when I was initially doing these optimizations, and this was like more than a year ago, I was seeing like a 30% slowdown due to the fact that it was doing protocol navigation. Um, and um, but these navigators here, um, like when we see the path, we don't need to do protocol indication. Like we know what the object is, we know what the value is. Um, so we can just look up what the protocol implementation is and then just call it directly and go from protocol indication to function indication, which is a lot faster. Um, so when Spectre compiles its paths, does that optimization. Now, the, the problem with that optimization is that um, looking up a protocol implementation is pretty slow. Um, so uh, one of the reasons why inline caching is so important is because the more work you do into path compilation, the more important that it is to only do that once and not have to pay that cost uh, every single time you want to execute that. Um, and there's a few other things it has to do is support some other features of Spectre. Uh, but basically what it all boils down to, it's kind of what you expect, right? It's the same thing you see from any compiler. The more work the compiler does, the slower it will take to compile, but the faster it will be at runtime. The exact same principle applies here. Uh, and basically what inline caching does is it allows you to not have to worry about the cost accomplished. Okay, so um, let's say you don't have inline caching. Uh, and Spectre didn't have inline caching until um, fairly recently. I don't remember exactly when I released it, I think it was like a few months ago. Um, and so uh, the way that you would uh, make Spectre fast before is you would manually pre-compile your paths. Um, so you would do something like this. Instead of writing a function like this, um, you would write a function like this, where you wrap the function in a closure and in this field C path, we will manually pre-compile this path, and then we will call C path directly within the function. And this will give it a huge, huge speed up. Right? So what we're doing here is we are uh, manually putting the compiler path somewhere uh, global to the function so that it can be reused every time the function runs. Now the goal of this presentation is to show what Spectre does so that this runs just as fast as this. Um, and that's where the inline caching comes in. And just like they don't do inline caching, the first time the function runs, it will compile the path. Then it finds a place to put that compiled path so that on all future indications, it can just be used that way. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, now, all right, so here's where it's a challenge. Uh, this, if this is all it had to do, um, it would actually be really easy. Um, but uh, it's not so easy, and actually it's really hard. And it took me literally years to figure out how to solve this problem. Um, and here's, here's the examples which really kill you. Uh, I'll show two examples. Uh, the problem is that paths can be dynamic. They can de 
path itself can depend on local function parameters. So like here's, uh, here's also two examples. So here's a function of reverse matching in range, which reverses the orders of all elements in the sequence between two indices that match the predicate. So I showed that before with um, reversing all the even numbers in some sequence. Um, so this is doing the same thing, except it's actually parameterized with the start index and the end index and the predicate. Um, here's the path, as you can see, it depends on these parameters. Um, and just to remind you what it does, uh, this is reverse matching the main between indices 2 to 7 on even numbers, and you can see it reverse order on even numbers. And here's uh, reverse matching the range between indices 0 and 8 on numbers divisible by 3. So you can see a 6 and 0 got reversed. 6, 3, and 0 got reversed. So, um, uh, let me show one more example. So this example, um, just to be a little bit more realistic, we have this bank data, and it's just a vector of maps which represent people's accounts. Um, so every account has a name, uh, a funds, a funds number, and then uh, potentially a key for the number of safe deposit boxes that person has. So here we have a function give safe deposit to matching takes in a min funds amount and then the you know, data structure of accounts. And what it will do is it will, it, it will add a safe deposit box to anyone with at least a certain amount of funds. And so you can see the path navigates every uh, map. If the funds is very equal to min funds, then we navigate the safe deposit boxes. If it's currently nil, we navigate to zero instead. And then we finally increment whatever number we found there. And just to show what this does, um, this is with min funds zero, so you can see it gives the same deposit box to everyone. And here's with min funds 1100, and this only gives the same deposit box to uh, everyone. And so you look at these, and these paths depend on local parameters. So this trick I did before of just taking the path and pre-compiling outside seems like it's not possible. Because how can you pre-compile a path which you can't even construct? because you need the parameters, right? Seems impossible. Um, all right. We're going to come back to that. Yeah. Visible to the user as possible. Um, 
you'll see more what I mean by this uh, as we go through it. So the first approach might try, um, there's actually this, um, there's actually, there used to be an issue for this on Spectrum's GitHub. Um, someone else opened it and called it pre-compiled automatically. And everything we've shown here, like the train of thought that led to its implementation, uh, this is basically like rehashing that discussion on the GitHub issue. Uh, but the first approach you might want to try to make it fast is to just memoize the composition of paths. Um, so instead of using this comp paths function to uh, do all the work with putting the navigation together and making that function, let's memoize it. Um, so memoizing basically says, if we haven't seen that combination of arguments before, then compute it, and then cache it in the map. Uh, otherwise, look up like that vector of arguments in the map and get the previous one. Uh, and then your transform is going to look like this, where we call like the transform execution function on memoized comp paths on path, um, and that's it. So, who thinks this is going to work? If it won't, why, what's, what's the problem with this implementation? It's the root. I mean, it can. Yeah, I will do that. It would, it, would be, it would be so bad if the paths were always static. The fact that a path can have a local variable means that your memory is not bound. It can use that to infinite memory. Right? So that's immediately thrown out the um, window. There's also a further, a further problem, which is. Um, uh, if you, um, there's a possibility that your program very rarely executes the exact same path multiple times, um, in which case it's going to be slow almost every single time. Uh, so that's not good. So the second approach you might try is memoize it, because this time bound the cache, limit the size of the cache. Um, so what's the problem with this approach? Inconsistent purpose, things fall out. Okay. Yeah, inconsistent, inconsistent performance. Um, along with the previous problem of, uh, as I just said, where you, you may not see the same path multiple times if it has multiple variables. Okay, so those are completely out of the window. Um, and it's pretty clear, if like, really think about it, that for this to work at all, we can only cache one thing per call site. And that one thing needs to be reusable no matter how the local variables change. Period, if it's going to work. Um, and the problem is that we have those dynamic parameters. We can't construct a path without the parameters and compile it. So, what do we do? Um, and so, the answer is to reverse the order of operations of what's happening. Uh, right now, the way you think about it, and the way it is the natural way to think about it, is you parameterize, get the path, and then compile the path. But in order to make this work, we need to flip it. We need to compile without the parameters and then parameterize and compile the path. Right? Okay, well, probably not, right? It's not obvious. Um, but let me show you uh, what I mean by this. Um, so the end result of it will look something like this. So let's take our reverse matching and range function again. Um, so again, forget about inline caching for a moment. Let's just figure out how to pre-compile it manually. Uh, the manual pre-compilation of this should look like this, where we compile path literally without the parameters. So just Throw an S range and just don't parameterize it. And then um, Fred actually is a navigator, which is parameterized with a function to both of us. Um, so that takes a parameter that we're not providing. So this C path compile navigator now requires three parameters two for S range and one for Fred. And then when we want to actually implement the function, we just call C path with start and predicate, and that will parameterize it, and then we can use it. So this is the idea for what it looks like. I haven't gotten into how this works uh, underneath the limit. OK, now we how it works. Um, so the way you define navigators is by using this macro called defnav, comes with separate. And if you look at it, what it looks like is that key path takes in a parameter key and then returns you an implementation of that protocol. That's what it looks like with key in the closure. That is not what it is in reality. Um, in reality, DefNav expands it to something like this. So the idea here is that um, rather than have the parameter in the closure, which has been basically screwing us before this, we're going to provide the, we're going to, 
would make a function which takes in um, some additional parameters um, or some additional arguments which inside contains all the parameters needed anywhere throughout the path. Um, and the way we're going to pass it through is we're going to thread through all the parameters and array of objects, which we call params, and then index into that array, which is called params index. And then the next function, here what I call the real next function, um, you need to pass it the parameters array um, as well as the parameters index. Um, and the parameters index needs to be incremented based on how many parameters you took off the array. So for example, for key path, key path reads one parameter off the array, so it reads key at the position parameters index off the parameters. And then because we wrote the code like this, uh, there needs to be some symbol next function which takes in sub-value. Uh, so what we do is we, in the closure, define next function to call real next function with params, with the params index incremented, and then with the structure. Right? And then this code is whatever the user typed in for that. It's the exact same thing with the transform bar. So instead of needing to provide a parameter and get a navigator back, now we have a new kind of navigator which takes a bunch of extra stuff and is threading a bunch of stuff around for you behind the scenes. But now we can take these functions and we can compose them all together, pre-compile it, and then provide the parameters right when we're about to use it, by like constructing an array and threading it through. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. Okay, so just as further pattern at home. So here's a really simple example which compiles key path, just two key paths together. Um, and here we, um, we pass it two parameters. So the first key path is going to receive the parameters array containing A and B with index zero. And then it's going to pass the exact same parameters array forward. And it's going to increment the index. Then this key path is going to read off the index one. So they will get the correct, these one will get the correct one. Um, now, in terms of what this does here, what happens when you actually call this compiled path with the um, parameters? Well, what it does is it constructs a two-element array with the first element set to A, the second element set to B, and then it calls its bind params function on the array and this, uh, this compiled path. And what it does is it takes, basically it just takes a new object and associates, sorry, it makes a new object and it associates it with the parameters array and the index. Uh, and we just take the select function, the transform function, out of this structure, which needs parameters, um, and it's just associated. So then when you execute it, it grabs the parameters index and it ends up with the array. Okay? So basically, bind params is the last thing that happens before you actually execute the okay. Any questions so far? Right, so one thing I want to emphasize here, um, this design is really good um, because you only ever need to make one array for the entire path, um, even if you have subpaths. Uh, so let's take like something like this, where we are um, composing, we are composing key path with um, and then we have that selected navigator, which takes in its own subpath. And then this path here can also require parameters. Um, but in terms of how it's defined with the single array that you spread through, it's totally fine. It doesn't matter if you have nested subpaths or how many nested subpaths you have. It's just one array. Where the, in this case, the first um, uh, index 0 will contain the parameter for this navigator, and index 1 will contain the parameter for this navigator. Um, and in terms of how something like selected works, um, again, there's another macro involved. Um, but selected takes in a path, and then there's this macro called fixed path nav, where you give it the path, and then it will bind for you a new symbol called repo, in this case called late. Um, and what's actually happening here is that path gets compiled at the time the path is constructed. Um, and then at runtime, it will bind parameters array to that compiled path with whatever index got passed in um, to this point. Um, so in this case, selected 
um, the parameters index and will receive index one. So we will take its parameters needed path and we'll bind it with the same array to start reading at index one. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so with this, um, with this kind of weird thing that we're doing, now we have the pieces necessary to do inline caching and make every use of Spectre fast. Uh, what we have is a way to compile paths to efficiently execute functions without the parameters, um, and we have an efficient way to provide the parameters when we have them, when the function is, is invoked. Um, now the problem we have to solve is, uh, is twofold. First of all, where do we store the compiled paths? Um, and the second one is how do you take a path and factor it into um, the static portion without parameters, um, and then a function that can then bind whatever local parameters you have into that static path. Um, and that's that's the core of the inline cache once you have these primitives in place. Okay, so third approach, uh, the two memoization approaches have already failed. Um, so the idea behind this approach is that um, we're going to keep transform and all the separate operations just super dumb. Um, and what we're going to do is rely on the user to just tell Spectre what should be back. Uh, and you tell it by just putting in these lines. Um, so it's like one, one potential way you do it is use question mark uh, to mark. So in this case, we mark in this path that this navigator is taking a parameter, and this navigator here is taking a parameter. Okay, in this case, this, this guy is parameter is A, but this guy's parameter is running in command line B. Um, so the idea is, is that um, whatever this macro is doing would be, extra, uh, when it analyzes this uh, path, it would look for the question mark to determine what the factor, and then it would produce two things. First is going to be compiling together this path. So it's just this, but we, um, we factor out the navigator, where we put the mark. And then we'll generate a function which takes in the locals A and B and produces an array of length of two. The first element is set to A, which is what was the first parameter. And the second element is set to B increment, which was the second parameter. Right? Now that we've kept it in cache, and then these two objects will be reused for all future indications. Um, where you just take your static path, you run this parameters function here, you get the array, you bind it, and then you execute it. All of which is really nice. Okay. Now in terms of what this macro looks like, um, uh, what it produces, it would look something like this. Um, the result of, of transform, of, of this transform call, of this transform call here, that would expand to something like this. Um, we have this thing called compile transform, which will just, uh, it takes a compile path and does the transform, right? Um, and then to actually give it the compile path, what we're gonna do is we are going to read from the cache, and we will, we will come to this later in terms of where the cache is and how we read from it and how we get to it. But for now, let's just assume that's a solved problem. We get from the cache, the cache object, and the cache object will contain two things in it, the compiled path and then the parameters function. Uh, if the cache is not nil, then just reuse it. Otherwise, we'll need to fill the cache. So we will fill the cache by doing the compilation and then producing this function. And the function can be done by the macro, because all the macro has to do is look for anything that starts with a question mark, um, see what all the local symbols are used there, and then make those the arguments to the function, and then just just generate all the code to set the command. So then once you have all that, you set the cache with that pair, um, and then uh, at runtime, you execute the parameters function on the local variable A and B, and you bind it into the file path, and that's it. You're done. Okay. And you can see the end result um, when we get to the final solution, of which this is definitely the last. Um, is the structure is very similar to this. So we're kind of just taking it step by step. 
All right. Um, so before we continue, uh, does anyone see any problems with this design? Um, put, putting the burden on the user to put the question mark for, for whatever part needs to be factored. From a user's perspective, it's not that different. Yeah, so from user perspective, not that different on the Definitely. Any other problems? So this code uh, can seriously blow up. It's just a function, and it compiles its subpath when you call it. 
Um, so you can't even, it, it, it's not even cheap to get the uncompiled path, because part of the path is compiling the subpaths. Um, now in theory, you might be able to just completely redesign how some method works, so it delays compilation until its parent path gets compiled. Possibly to do that. Um, it would add a lot of less expensive implementation. But just the fact that you still have that cost, even if it was cheap to get the uncompiled path, that equality check um, is not good. And you combine it with the fact that the special market is really confusing and you can mess up. So this just doesn't seem like a good um, and it turned out we could do much better than this. Okay. Not these uh, ask questions. Okay, so we're, we oh, sorry. Just real quick, you, you didn't mention how get cache and set cache work. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get to Okay, so I didn't listen. Um, okay. All right, so what we want to do in our design, uh, we're going to rule out just having these markers and really having the user not to do anything uh, in order to make it like caching. Uh, which means that however transform and select all operations work, they need to figure out all the back of the pack completely automatically, and they can't make any mistakes in the back of it. The mistake can lead to like this disaster scenario I talked about with the front or the interface. Um, and like here's some like cases that we need to distinguish. So if you see something like selected keyword A, keyword B, that should not be backward. That should be kept as is. If you see key path to local symbol, that should be backward. Um, if you see something like using a regular closure function with local symbol, you should not factor that. That should actually execute as is. And then there's also many cases which are impossible to factor, uh, in which case uh, specters would fail basically. Uh, so one case is uh, use a local symbol where a navigator is expected. So in case you don't know what the, what the navigator is at that point, like this, the navigator itself is literally a parameter, uh, in which case it would just, just count uh, uh, So in that case, it should fall back to either um, just compile the path in every indication, or throw an error of some sort. Uh, I understand in reality, this gives you the option. There's a global flight you can set to decide which one you're going to do. Um, same thing here. Here we have a special form where now we have to set it. Obviously, we can't compile the special form. Uh, if we use a dynamic bar, um, there's a bar we can change values in every indication. We can't pre compile that because that value may change. Uh, so these are the main cases where that needs to be detected and do the right thing. All right, approach number five. Um, and this approach would actually work in theory, although this is not the approach that we're using, as you'll see in the end. So the idea here is um, to do the factoring. Um, it's not enough to just look at the path um, as like symbols and lists, which is what you get in macro. You need to know the values of these elements. You need to know which element is a navigator. Um, which can be backed out and then be compiled. You just need to know where everything is. Um, so the idea here is that we will use closure's function called resolve. Um, and what resolve does is it takes in a namespace and a symbol and returns you the bar. Imagine those parameters. And from the bar, you can get the map. So here at macro time, we'll call resolve and actually figure out what are we actually looking at beyond just the fact that we're looking at a bunch of this symbols. Um, and then using those values to do the um, uh, do the factor uh, and also generate the prime assumption. Uh, so in order to do this, you do need to know what the local symbols are so that you know if the symbol you're looking at is a local or if it's not a local, it must be a global bar of some sort. Um, and then this is how you get um, this is how you get all the locals um, where the macro is called. So this is an implicit parameter called ampersand n. Um, it's a map. So it contains additional information about the symbols. Um, in this case, we only care about what the local symbols are. So we just take the keys and turn them into the same. Right? And then you would walk the path, get the values of symbols that are not locals, um, resolve them, uh, get the value of the bar. You can also check if the bar is dynamic or not. Check in that case I was talking about before. 
Um, and if this is a normal navigator, we can factor it out, we can get our path to the compiler. Um, so the result of this, of all this analysis, the result would be the same as what it was when we put the markers, except it's doing automatically. Um, so this right here is exactly what I showed with the, uh, the result of the markers, except here we do automatically. Um, so I didn't do this. Um, I think it would work, although macros like and like this kind of like advanced stuff, um, like you just run into things you didn't expect. But I think you could get this to work. Um, the reason I didn't do this is because it wouldn't work in closure scripts. Because resolve runs in closure, uh, macros run in closure, where resolve is going to give you not something which corresponds to what the runtime is, which is closure script. Right. Yeah, it also lock down the bars, right? Uh, it also lock down the bars, so it's stacking it unless you're doing something with the current value of the bar, but that might change if you're in a live coding situation. Um, yes, well, we check for this. The best we can do is check for that. Check I mean, it. So, so it would only factor it out if, if, so when you resolve the, when you would resolve the symbol, it yeah. would, uh, uh, it would only factor it out if it's also marked as if it's not marked as dynamic. If it's not marked as dynamic, okay. it can still redefine. Absolutely, and that is something where the factoring there's nothing you can do about that, right? Yeah. So that is the one thing that factoring cannot handle is you redefine it and not have it. Yeah, there's just no way to handle it. Even beyond yeah, the final solution, no, it doesn't handle that. That's the thing. I'll get to that. Like the same thing, you call ultra bar root. There's just no way to handle that case. That's the one case you can't handle. But um, in like a real program, you just shouldn't be doing that. Like ultra bar root, you should use. Well, I, I know you do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, in a normal program, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and it's really like a specter. Like, there's not really a reason to do it by an app here. I understand why you would do it, like in a rap or like you're smart things. Um, but that's, that's, that's like the only like gotcha if I consider it to be like extremely minor. But let's just finish the email. Okay, so it doesn't work in close scripts, right? so that's just like, we just can't do this because the spectrum works has to be found in close scripts too. Um, okay, so what do we do? Um, well, I mean, we know which approach, what we need to do. We need to look at the values of the path and, and like not execute anything in the path. Um, uh, we just can't do it at macro time. So the only option is to do it at runtime. And what we have to do is not let the path that you specify resolve normally. Okay, we'll have to resolve it differently. All right, and this is the key to it. And this took me a long time before I had this insight. Um, what we're going to do is in the macro, let's say the user types in this as their path. What we're going to do is in the macro, the macro expansion um, is going to look like this, where we are going to gener uh, generate code which produces basically an abstract syntax tree of what the user typed in here. We start off with symbols of this, and when here we will have something which is like an abstract syntax tree. Where, so let's just go through it. So all will then turn into, um, because we see all is not corresponding to a local symbol, it becomes a bar use record, where we give it all, so that when this gets to runtime, that will be the value of all, and then we also capture the bar for all, so that we can check this right now. Um, this expression here, keypad A, will become this, a function communication record, where the operation is going to be keypad, which then turns into bar use, Again, it's just key path does not correspond to a mobile symbol. Um, and then the parameters is going to be a list of parameters. In this case, we see that A corresponds to a local parameter of the function. If we just pretend this is a function, and we capture, capture it as a symbol, so we quote the symbol, so at runtime we just have the symbol. We do the same thing all throughout, and we get a tree, we get basically an abstract syntax tree. And then, at runtime, we can analyze this. We can figure out where things need to be factored based on what are locals and where the actual navigators are. We can actually also figure out if 
can factor and then take the corresponding fallback. Um, and the end result of analyzing this, we will produce this uh, path here to pre-compile, where we factored out the parameters for the two keypads, and we will generate this parameters function here, which takes them into locals, creates the array, and then gives it the parameters. Okay. Does this make sense in terms of the goal of this macro? And, and we're going to dive into it a little bit. All right. All right, so um, now so far I've been kind of showing things like you take the transform operation and the map expansions and all this kind of stuff. Well, there's a lot of operations in Specter. There's transform, select, select, and traverse. Um, so all this behavior of doing this crazy abstract syntax tree stuff and analysis and inline caching is just going to be factored out into this macro called the app. The app will do all of this stuff. So then something like transform. Uh, it's also going to be a macro, but it just will stand something like this, where it just wraps the path that the user wrote in with the path of the macro, and then all the core details are inside this macro. Cool. All right, so here's the path. Um, so it's not that long. It's uh, like 30 lines of code, I think. Um, but it calls some pretty crazy functions, which we'll dive into later. But I think the general structure, what well, you should recognize, because you've already seen most of the general structure. Um, so path is a macro that takes in this path. So again, this path is just going to be a bunch of symbols and lists and vectors. We don't know what the values are. Um, so first thing we'll do is we'll figure out what are all the local symbols in this, where this macro is called. And then we're going to actually walk the path and figure out which of those local symbols are actually even used somewhere in the path. Okay, and that's just doing just a walk of the entire data structure. Uh, next thing we have to do is we're actually going to do a full macro expansion of the path right here. And we're going to do it before we do any further analysis. Um, and the reason that's important is because it should be perfectly valid to write a path like this. We're using macro in the path. But this, if we can't factor, if, if, if it still contains symbols that correspond to macros, we can't factor that. Um, so we did the factoring approach that I just showed. We have to factor into something like this. Function indication, and then this is a symbol that does not correspond to a local, so it becomes a bar use. And then you would just get a runtime error of can't take the value of the macro. This is trying to take the value of the um, So what we'll do to get around that is we'll just do the macro extension. Um, and it turns out that you have to use this library. Um, closures, uh, like this closure.walk slash macro expand all, um, that actually won't work. Um, well, it didn't work for me, because I had situations where I had, I was calling path inside the definition of another path. So the inner path also needs access to the correct environment, and closure.walk slash macro expand all totally loses the environment and that's what matters. Uh, Zach Tellman wrote this awesome library called Ridley, which provides a macro stand all, which doesn't lose the environment. And that's kind of like in the weeds a little bit, but that's why it's doing that there. It's not really that important. Next thing we'll do is we'll call this function called IC prepare path, which stands for inline cache prepare path, which takes in the local symbols and then the macro standard path, and it returns the prepared path. And the prepared path is just um, this is going to be this, this code right here. Okay, so that at runtime we can actually analyze what the values are. And well, we'll look at the implementation of this once we uh, get through this map. Alright, so now we get to, finally, how do you actually make an inline cache and use it and get from it and set on it? Okay, so what we're going to do is in the macro, we're going to intern a new global variable and we're going to generate a symbol for it called cache thing. And we're going to initialize it to be this mutable cell object. And all mutable cell is an instance of this Java class, um, where it really just can, contains a single mutable field that you can get instead. You can't get more efficient than that when it comes to an inline cache, at least um, for what code of you do. Um, you could get more efficient in theory, but not, uh, not with code. Is there any reason to not use a volatile? Then I use a volatile? Yeah. I, I used to do that. This is um, faster. 
I actually saw all the ads from them. Oh, uh, yeah, you might want to do that. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't. Obviously, in Photoshop, you're using something a little bit different. But, um, I, just, I just, I know exactly what my code this is, so I know it's, this is really fast. <laughs> Uh, actually, no, there's a, we'll, we'll, we can talk about the Photoshop software, uh, but there's actually, like, uh, there's something new in Photoshop that you can't do in Photoshop. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, so I'll explain that now. So intern is the dynamic version of get. Okay? So we can really just say into this name, to this space, at this symbol, that's what that means now. It's dynamic. It's like basically dynamic get. Okay? Uh, and we're doing it in the macro. Uh, and so we have to tell it what namespace. So this dynamic variable namespace will be set to the namespace of wherever this instance of the macro is being called. Right? Um, so it's basically, when we resolve that symbol as a bar, it needs to be in the right namespace, which just happens to be that namespace. Uh, we'll have some more trickiness with namespaces later. All right, so then the path macro, it will expand to this code here which will produce the efficient parameterized cloud map. Okay, so at runtime, so this is all runtime code. So at runtime, we will first read from our mutable cell that's in the cache. Um, okay, and we have the same, we'll call it info. So if info is nil, that means this is the first time through this call cycle. So we have this function. Uh, I call it a magic pre-compilation, so, which kind of uh, captures my feelings at the time I was writing it. Um, and magic pre-compilation takes in the prepared path, which is this, this thing that we produced. Um, it takes in the namespace where this macro was expanded. Um, you'll see why we need that later. And it takes in the vector of local symbols um, that are used in the path. Again, this is why this, where this is used later. Uh, but let's just pretend like this is a magic function, which just works. And so this will return us this cache path info record, um, which contains within it the compiled path, which may need parameters, and then a function, uh, which takes in the locals and produces the array to then bind to the path. Okay, uh, once we produce it, we set it into the cache and we return it, and now this guy is going to be um, everything we need to finish. So we grab the compiled path, we grab the params function, which is called params maker. So if specter failed to factor, it just sets the precompiled and param maker field to nil. So if precompiled is nil, that means it's not even it's impossible to factor that path. So we will just compile it on every indication. Um, otherwise, and this is for, um, for pretty much every use case of Spectre, um, pretty much every use case of Spectre and, and letter in my caption, um, we'll go to this code path. So if params maker is nil, that means there are no parameters to this path. So just use the compile path directly. Otherwise, we will call the params maker function with the Locals that it means that will give us the array, and we bind it to a file path to get the executable path. So you're asking why don't I just check if I need to compile them? Yeah, but um, the caching is, once you compile it, the caching part is basically free. It's, it's like 0.001% of the caching maybe. And why, why not compile it? There's, there's nothing that can go wrong. Yeah, 
Well, you have to compile it in order to execute. Right? Um, like, I don't really know any functions where, uh, like, every function only updates all at once. Um, in which case, you would want some, like, approach which is fast, which is, you know, it's just not really realistic in this case. The cost here is a little bit of an um, but it's, it's just literally, like, you know, it's a compile path. It's just one, it's just one field for call site. So if you step it a thousand times, there's a thousand fields. It's not a big deal. Um, any other questions? Try to move on to like the assumptions. Okay. Alright, so first there's basically two functions here, which we have in mind, which is preparing the path and then this magic precompilation thing. Uh, so prepare path, it's actually really simple. Um, so again, we need to take this and turn it into this. Okay. All right, so we, we need to know what the locals are to determine if something should be a bar use or whether it should be a local symbol. Um, so if, uh, is it, uh, okay. so if we're looking at a vector, then we will just recurse on all the elements of the vector with the exact same function. So just prepare the elements of the vector. If we're looking at a symbol, uh, if it's a local, then we produce local sim. Um, and so we want to capture, uh, so it actually in reality captures a little bit more than what I was showing over here. Just because here I want to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, so for locals, it actually captures the value of the local. Uh, as well as the symbol for the local at um, And if it's not a local, then we make a bar of use, and here we capture the value of the bar, the actual bar itself, and then the symbol that was used to refer to the bar. If what we're looking at is a function indication, which is it's just it's either a list or it's an instance of one of these, um, in almost all cases it should just be a list. And what we're going to do is take this function vacation and grab the operation, which is the first element, and then all the params, which are the rest of the elements. If the op symbol is a special symbol, the special symbol is actually a closure for a function, which tells you if that symbol refers to a special form. So if it's a special form, then we capture it as usage of special form. Um, and we capture basically the value, whatever that's, if that special form to, as well as the actual code for the special form. Otherwise, we capture a function indication structure where we recurse on all the um, we recurse on the op, and we recurse on all the params, and we capture the full code um, at this point. Otherwise, if it was none of those things, then we just code it and capture it. So in this case, cases like this will be just using like a keyword or a set. Okay, that's it, and that does that does everything you need to prepare the app, um, so that the analysis can be deferred for one time. Any questions? All right, so let's jump into magic precompilation. All right. Uh, okay, so. Uh, most of the work is done by this other function. Uh, here's the structure of management compilation. Uh, so basically, we need to um, so we need to take that giant abstract syntax tree and we need to extract from it the path that we're going to precompile and cache, as well as any of the parameters that we use that we're found for now. Uh, and so the way I chose to do it here is we're actually just going to pass into magic precompilation star an atom, which is going to be a vector of all the parameters, and also an atom to indicate whether or not, whether it failed to fast the path. So we ran into one of the cases that should have been um, like a special form of the navigator. So we, then this function, magic precompilation star, will extract out the path, which can then be compiled and cache, and it will fill in these atoms. So if we failed, so if that was said to true, then we check that a 
mentioned this before, there's a global flag. So if you say must cache as, then at this point we'll throw a runtime exception. It failed to cache the path. Um, and actually, I recommend that everyone set this because there's no reason that your path should be factorable in front of the path. Uh, usually, when, cache, when a path is not factorable, it's like a really simple tweet to make it factorable. Um, otherwise, if you don't set that flag, then the cache result will just be nil for the pre file path and the parameter function, and that will cause the path macro to just compile the path in the application. Otherwise, if we take the path, we compile it. Um, and from what was put into the parameters atom, we extract the exact code that was used to specify those parameters. Um, and if there were any parameters, then we make that function, the params function, that will take in the local symbols and uh, produce the array of parameters. Um, and then we return the results that can be cached. Any question about that so far? So I'm taking kind of slow because it's pretty like, uh, we're pretty, we're pretty in the weeds right now. Um, all right, so first I actually want to show this make params maker function. This is actually like the most interesting part. Uh, so this is going to take in the namespace where the path macro was called. Um, then it's going to take in the vector of code used for the parameters. And then it takes in the um, local symbols that are used throughout the path. Okay, and what we need to do here is create a function. But remember, we're at runtime now. We're no, no longer in a macro. So if we're going to create a function and take all these different pieces of code and slap them together, um, there's not, like, code is not going to evaluate anything for you, like it would if you did macro sanction. So we need to evaluate our function ourselves. The way this works is that we will construct the function which produces the parameters of rank. And the function takes this argument, the use locals, um, and then we create a, uh, an array that contain, that is out of the length of exactly the number of parameters needed. And then we will create um, an A set for every parameter. And we can basically just do a map index. So for every parameter, we just put the code for that parameter here, set it to that index on the array sim, um, and then return it back. Okay, and we email. First, the Zoom we use the eval. Um, I personally have never seen. Um, now, there is this binding call. We bind the namespace used for the eval with um, whatever namespace this namespace, this namespace string refers to. Why is that? And then tell me why we do that. Well, if you refer to stuff using namespace as part of your path, be able to get it to the same yes, concept. that's exactly right. And where this eval runs is totally disassociated from where it was defined. We capture where it was defined in the path macro and then thread it through the runtime so we can use it. Um, cool. Okay, so that's the parameters function. So the last piece is this magic pre-compilation star, which actually is pretty straightforward. We have our abstract syntax tree, and now we just need to recursively analyze it and extract what we need. So I don't want to go through every detail of it. It's just a long function, which is just how to handle all the cases. Um, so we'll just go through it. Um, so if we're looking at a vector, then just um, do the extraction on every element of the vector. Um, if we're looking at a local symbol, well, we're expecting the navigator, but we see a local symbol, so this is not a factorable path, so we fail. Um, if we're looking at a bar, then we take the bar, and we also take the value of the bar. If it's a dynamic bar, then we fail, because we're expecting the navigator, but it's a dynamic bar. If the value of the bar is an actual navigator, then we, that is what should be the navigator for this bar. Um, otherwise, if it's not a valid navigator, we don't know what it is. Um, it's just some regular code function that should not be there, so we fail. Um, if it's a function indication, so in this case, we look at the operation. If the operation is a bar, we then check if it's dynamic, then fail. Otherwise, if it is a grand needed path, so 
something defined with that man that requires parameters. Then we add all these parameters to the params atom, and then we just return the value to the bar, which is the params that we have. So that basically transforms something like this into just this, and then the A symbol gets put into the parameters. Doing this recursive descent. Right? And then there's just a bunch of cases, including stuff about that I haven't talked about. So we don't need to look at all of this, um, but it's just a recursive descent, analyze the object syntax tree, extract the path that can be compiled, also extract the parameters, and you can see how the parameters are used there. Um, and that is a working inline patch implementation. Uh, there's one more thing which I just forgot to mention though. Um, so this path macro that I showed, specifically with how it does the, um, uh, the inline cache, it turns out this works totally fine, this code right here, with how it creates and access to the inline cache, but it does not work if you AOT compile your code. Why not? Can anyone tell me about it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was very confused about this at first as well. Um, so in the macro, we are interning the bar, right? And we're giving it the value of the immutable cell, oh. right? Now when you AOT compile, the macro stands at compilation stage, um, but where the bar is initialized is going to be lost. It happens in the macro, it, it never happens at runtime. There's no runtime code which initializes that bar. So this right here is going to fail the class cast exception. It's going to get nil if you able to compile, because nothing ever initialized it. Could you check, see if you're there there? Yeah, so an alternate way to do this, so there's two ways you can do it. First, and I'll show you the way I chose. First, you could just not, not initialize it, just intern without initializing, um, and then do it nil check here, and then initialize the cell. Um, uh, Oh yeah, yeah, you do a mill check and then do an alter bar root to, to actually modify the bar. Um, what I chose to do is different, it basically gets you the same result, but I chose to do this code right here. So we try cache, class cache exception. If the bar is down, then we don't know what the heck is happening. Because uh, the only case this should happen is if it's an unbound bar. Um, otherwise, we do an alter bar rule instead of enable stuff. Okay. This handles specifically a to All right. Okay. So, um, right. so that's inline hashing, etc. All the story details. Um, so you see, it's pretty intense, pretty advanced. Like we really have to know, we really have to know a lot about the same code. Let me just finish this up. Um, so this is actually a general technique in language, and I didn't mention this, but um, like the JVM relies very heavily on inline caching for it to work. So, like invoke interface to be fast, and invoke to be fast, and all this stuff. And Clojure itself also leverages inline caching. Um, so protocols use a little bit of inline caching. Although, to be honest, I still don't really understand how protocols work, um, even after we're going to code. Um, but also, uh, closure keywords also use inline caching, which I thought was really interesting. So if like, you do a keyword lookup into a record, it will actually, um, on the first, um, first run through, it will extract this thing called a lookup from, which um, takes a keyword and then asks the record, do you have a lookup from for this keyword? And so basically, if you define that key in the record when you find it, it will then put a function there in line which does direct field access instead of having to translate the keyword to the code. It's actually really cool how Clojure works. So that's something that Clojure does for inline caching. Um, but the most typical usage for inline caching is for type based dispatch, where you speak a little cache of what was the method used for the type of zero on the code after that. Um, but there's actually a lot of other reasons 
potential use cases for this technique that I showed. So I showed it for Spectre, and a lot of the things I showed were specific to Spectre in terms of like paths and subpaths and how things get compiled and how you fed the parameters you're right through. Um, but just to like give uh, examples of other use cases in which you could use this technique to great effect. You could use it for regular expressions, right? You could imagine parameterizable regular expressions um, so that you pre-compile a form of regular expressions without the parameters, and then you have some efficient way of providing the parameters later. Same thing with parsers, like the exact same idea is spec. Um, the idea translates directly to SQL. And I'm sure we've all used SQL libraries. I mean, there's a concept of parameterized SQL, where you compile a SQL query, um, and you just tell it where the parameters are, and then you give it the parameters when you want to invoke it, but it's already compiled for you, so you don't have to cross compilation. If you leveraged this inline caching technique, you could just have all that compilation done um, under the hood, completely automatically. Um, uh, I wrote this library called Castlelog a long time ago, and I could have used inline caching for Castlelog. So again, same thing, you have the query, you know the parameters, um, you analyze the predicates to determine the parameters, and you pre-compile something and provide the parameters later. But the same thing you can see how you can see this applies in so many cases. Um, and I think this is a really powerful thing because um, like when you ever do, like inline caching especially, this is like the core technique for why dynamic languages can be with static languages. Um, and this is for all these really cool use cases. It allows you to write your code in a really flexible, really abstractly expressive way and not sacrifice performance. Not have to mess with having to know static. You can use dynamic information to make it fast. Um, and this is some more food for thought. Like what I've been showing with Spectre is actually like relatively easy use case for inline caching, where on the first run through, you know exactly what you need for all future communications. But you can imagine other um, cases where um, you do something like, let me actually look at the data I'm seeing at the call set, and then let me determine which code I should use based on the data. And maybe I have a guard so that if that condition fails at some later point, I, I change to some other code path. Um, you can imagine all sorts of ways you can use this technique. Um, again, like getting away from the static mindset of needing to know things ahead of time really fast and doing things in a more clever way um, and getting that speed without sacrificing uh, expressiveness. Uh, thanks, Nathan. We'll open it up for questions, yeah. and uh, just just raise your hand, and I'll give you the mic. Um, am I right in saying that this technique would not work for platforms without runtime eval? Oh, oh, that's a really good question because closure does not be eval, right? And I said that Spectre does work with closure in my passion. Um, so if, with closure, I had to take a different approach. Um, less efficient than the eval approach. Um, and I'll just try to like summarize it. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, but basically, um, because I don't have eval, I don't know ahead of time, because I don't know until one time what the parameters are going to be, right? But I do know ahead of time what all the possible parameters are, like all the expressions that could be parameters, right? Like if you see a function indication, expression, anything in there could be a parameter. Right? Same for nested function But I don't, I don't know which one that is. Which ones are actually parameters. Like if you use selective, which is a higher order navigator, that is, those parameters are not going to be parameters for the file path. Uh, so what the closure version does is it creates a bunch of um, zero argument functions for all the possible parameters so that they don't actually get evaluated. And then at runtime, when it figures out which ones are the parameters, it Evaluates the zero argument functions to get the result of that. Um, that's just the broad term. Okay, so this is a little complicated. Um, if you actually look at Spectre's actual implementation, you can see the different code paths for closure and closure. And the big difference is because of that. Uh, at least not in most use cases of closure. Uh, 
Uh, so I haven't looked at the implementation of Hiccup, but could this be used for something like Hiccup where you have uh, a lot of arguments uh, that are not changing and you do like some sort of programs? Uh, so remind me what Hiccup is doing. Transforms like nested data structures in HTML. Oh, it turns yeah, yeah. Basically, what would, what would you have? Um, well, like, if you had a hiccup form, it's like HTML, body, div, 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 title, or title with like the whole form to Yeah. At runtime, all you really want to do is like the title to this form. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. You're thinking maybe it's faster instead of just constructing the whole structure to track every time. Construct it once and then it's so stupid you can answer the same thing. I think it's a macro, so you're getting that right over. Well, so I think it takes just back to just normal footage data and let's say that if you're creating that in a function somewhere, I think for example, is, is so often you have this pattern where you have big complicated, yeah. but it's all static, it's all just literal. And then, and then you just parameterize it on something coming in. So deep down inside of it, there's like, oh, one little thing that I can. Yeah. But you're paying to create a whole data structure every time that comes in. Right? Yeah. So, and then that flows eventually off to, sooner or later, you make this huge thing, and then that, usually like in one place in your code, turns into HTML, right? So the, uh, um, I think you could, so I'm guessing you could do that. Um, it might be hard to do that in a way where uh, what you're actually returning is still a vector. That's so important. Right. I see. Yes. Some of it is also is the cost of constructing this, this giant nested vector from scratch. Is that greater than just taking one instance of it? And then just, you know, the cost of the power of the data starts to work to just change that one field. Who's the one based on the other one? I guess you'd say something if it's down different, if there's a lot of stuff down other branches. But like, you have to make it extra time. Yeah, but let, let's say, like, if you take, like, one case. And I don't, I don't think, I doubt this is representing more cases. Let's say you have a one million element vector, which is your case now, right? And there's one from within the model. Well, certainly, just taking one instance of it and then associating a new pattern in the middle will be definitely faster than just making the million element vector from scratch. Yeah. But I, I doubt that that is true for all cases. So it might be possible that the pickup, it could do some runtime analysis of the data. Maybe I should have done that or not. Um, and then I was also questioning, I don't know, like, if you're running a form to get up. Um, There's a lot of stuff like that, too, like, like not pre caching constant vectors. Like, there's no, I believe, at least in our implementation, there's no, there's no, there's no, in Davos, there's no uh, if there's a bunch of constants, if you just have a vector and there's only constants in it and it's a literal, it still makes the thing every time you hit that code path. Despite the fact that we could have just had one or about that. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, certainly if there is a local symbol there, it's definitely not big. There's nothing in there. Yeah, there's a local you need to, but if, even if there isn't, you still yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean quick to speak because of local, you could cache the whole thing and just associate that local the whole site. Right. Which okay. just comes back to the question, is that faster? Well my big factor would think of it's a like Swiss string generation. Pre compiled all the parts vector that pop down the the dynamic parts, you lose the, it wouldn't be a vector anymore, it would just create all the Exactly. I guess it's just a free off. Oh, yeah, any other questions? I was wondering about scale, but I'll be, uh, I'll be probably going to some pleasure on the book today. Virtual implementation for vectors, is that? Uh, well, uh, I was just wondering if you had a gigabyte uh, or a stupid uh, terabyte data structure, uh, would this thing fall apart? Um, in, in spec or in the general thing? Uh, I was just trying to use it. I mean, vector? Yeah. Oh, you mean like the general thing on spec? I would like to use vector on uh, this uh, virtual memory based database. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'll probably do now. Yeah, because like transform needs to um, like like if you go like a million levels, you can do a structure. Um, 
uh, the call sign will be really fun to see. Or just by necessity, because it needs to do it or something. I don't think that works. Another pro tip is to give people a draw. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You make other million teams. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it depends on the transformation. Uh, it, it matters more how the GP is on the Okay. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's not too deep. I think there's a fixed size on how deep look the data storage is going to be anyway because of the hashing algorithm. I've heard, I haven't checked it, but that that, that there's actually a recursive thing to figure that out, which what make, limits you to the call stack size. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. yeah. But uh, in terms of like spectral blocking. Um, you can actually compare Spectre's select versus transducers. It allows you a lot of overlap in these cases. And Spectre's not stopped transducers for the overlap in these cases, but it's actually really close. Really um, and actually, underneath, they use very similar implementations in terms of like, uh, they both use like a certain bottom being really on the other. It seems like the part that's doing the inline cache is sort of. Orthogonal to other parts? Is there any chance to bring that as a library or something? Yeah, I think that's a possible pattern. Um, so it would be really interesting just to like for those four more use cases in that caption to figure out how to like what would a generic library be. Certainly just the stuff doing just like a bunch of people. Um, I think we can back that out. Um, but I think it's like a general concept of uh, like cache static portion and how to efficient way to combine it together. So uh, I think it's, for me it's unclear like how does that generalize. Um, I understand I understand very well the spectrum, like really what the same regular expression and same parsers, which parts are similar, which parts are reads. Um, I think I mean I get the intuition there's something there. So uh, and, and and is there any um you talk about the concurrency? Oh, yeah. I mean, is it just eval and a concurrent setting makes me a little nervous? Is there, like, could two things hit that at once? Is there any... Why? Yeah, it is possible two things could hit that at once. Yeah. Um, but it's it probably deterministic. So one of them will win, and the other one will get lost. It doesn't matter if the other one's lost. Right. So it will eventually work itself out. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Um, that's like more of a general question about spec. You mentioned that you wanted it to become part of the spec. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about spec a lot too. So you mentioned you wanted it to become part of Core of War. Have you have you talked to the core team? Uh, I never I never actually said that. I think other people said it. Like, I think <laughs> I think I remember you saying that at the SoundCloud we have like, I think I said like I'd be open to it. Okay. But well. I, I, I haven't heard anyone from that say anything else like that. Okay. Uh, except for like Greg when he interviewed me on the podcast. He was like, that's what it's cool. And so that's apparently the official kind of stance off the One guy that needs to say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, so like my, first, my personal feeling about Spectre is this solves a very deep, very fundamental problem. Once you embrace the idea of individual data structures, this comes up all the time. You need to just manipulate some massive value. And it's a freaking nightmare to do it with open um, It comes up, this comes up so often. That's why like I somehow arrogantly refer to it as code of um, But like as it's actually been a learning process for me with Spectre. Like I kind of made it because I was dealing with this nested data structure and stuff. And then my mind adapted to this concept of navigation, and I was like, holy shit, like, this is such a broad way of like, constructing programs. And it changed the way like, I think about going about designing programs. Um, it's just like, I feel like if you're using mutable data structures, you absolutely have to have an abstraction like this if you're going to avoid just making your final product. So why don't you reach out to them and just ask if they want to add it to the closure form? I mean, the certs are not a value to just be able to develop it independently for now. Um, I mean, if they asked me, I would consider working with them. I mean, the thing is, like, it's a little bit scary, like, working with, like, the order development process. Uh, like, I don't know. Um, so, uh, I 
and I, I would consider it. Like, if they ask me, like, I would probably look for it, and be honest. Um, but, like, I have no startups to do, so, like, it's not like a priority to me. Like, I may expect to write open source it, and hopefully that's good enough for people for now. Um, I do think we pull with Sparta closure. Um, like, Spectre's only a few libraries that I personally like. I can use, like, you know, closure's namespace important into every file. I just I treat it like a part of the language. Sorry, okay, last question. Um, uh, is, um, this isn't directly, this is more Spectre than in my patches, but the uh, Spectre dispatch on pro the protocols? Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it, it starts all the protocol the that. Okay, so how, how do you extend Spectre to native, if you want to traverse over native uh, types, can you do that? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, you, can, you can extend the protocol to native. Uh, uh -huh. But then when it compiles the path, it will look up the uh, protocol function. So, so it'll, it'll look up whatever function was attached to that type. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a protocol based uh, dispatch system for, in terms of how it interprets the traversal of a, of a particular native type? Um, yeah, okay. that's somewhat changing the next version. Yeah. Um, but it's the same domain. 